Hey guys, Mr. P. In this video, we're going to talk about the physical properties of water, specifically IB understanding A116, which states physical properties of water and the consequences for animals in aquatic habitats. We're going to include buoyancy, viscosity, thermal conductivity, and specific heat within our discussion. We're going to contrast the physical properties of water with those of air and illustrate the consequences using examples of animals that live in water and air, such as the black-throated loon and the ringed seal. It is important to note that when students are referring to an organism in an examination, either the common name or the scientific name is acceptable, and common name would be the black-throated loon and the ringed seal. So we're gonna start our discussion about buoyancy. So buoyancy is one of those items that is contained within that understanding. And we have two organisms, one that lives in water and one that lives in air. And so a definition of buoyancy is an upwards force exerted on an object placed in a medium. And both water and air are both mediums. So we have a buoyancy effect in both water and air. If you've spent any time in water, and I know that you've spent time in air, you know that there is not an equal buoyancy between the two. You are much more buoyant in water than you are in air. And so the buoyant force equals the weight of the water displaced by the object. The buoyant force is upwards because there is more pressure from below in the water than above in the air. When an object like this fish, or like you when you're swimming, is in water medium, you have a much more exerted buoyant force from below than you do from above, which is why you have that weightlessness feel, or you feel lighter in the water and are able to somewhat float on the top or the top portion of that water column more easily than you are to float in the air, which is impossible. In contrast, an object placed in air has an almost insignificant buoyant force. This force is equal to the weight of the air displaced by the object, which obviously isn't much. Every object that is in a medium displaces an amount of that medium. So when you are a fish in water, you are displacing the amount of water that is equal to the weight of that water. In an object that is in air, you are displacing equally the amount of air that takes up the space that you are, but the water displaced is much heavier than the air displaced because water weighs more than air. Either way, buoyancy is a property of water that is exhibited in both water and air because both water and air are mediums there is just a greater buoyant force in water than in air. Viscosity is the degree to how fluid a medium is. Obviously, there is a greater viscosity in water than there is in air, and you can do an easy experiment to test that theory, meaning if you go out and run in the air, it is much easier and you are able to go much faster than if you try to run in water. The same athlete or the same person running on land or in water, you will exhibit a much greater top end speed on land and in the air than you do in the water simply because air has less viscosity than water. Thermal conductivity is how much energy a medium can absorb. Water can absorb a lot more energy than air and withstand temperature change, meaning it is a lot easier for air to heat up than water. It doesn't take as much energy to heat up the air than it does water. It takes a substantial amount of energy to heat up water, which also applies to high specific heat capacity, which is the amount of energy a medium like water can absorb without changing much ambient temperature. If we look at this particular data from May 17th to May 22nd, you can see two lines. You have a blue line, which indicates the lake temperature, which is the temperature of the water, and then you have a, an orange or brown line, which is the air temp. When you look at this data holistically, you will notice that there is a greater amount of fluctuations and a greater number of fluctuations in the air temp, meaning there is a spike and a low, a high and a low for each day, May 17th through May 22nd. So the air temp is increasing and decreasing at an hour by hour basis. However, water can absorb or give off a great deal of heat without changing temperature very much, and you can see that because there is zero real big spikes and there is a little bit of fluctuation, but the fluctuations, while they do correspond a little bit with the peaks of the ambient air temperature, they are not at all 
peaking and dipping to the same degree that the air temperature is changing. Now there is one spike right here that is probably an error on data collection because there's no way water will spike that high. That's a 20 degree difference on an hour basis. So there probably was an error in their data collection. But for the most part, you can see that there is very little temperature change in the lake compared to a lot of temperature change that is occurring on land. The temperature of the air changes easily and rapidly due to weather events, which can correlate to just simply sun exposure. During the day, temperatures typically spike, and at night, when the sun is not there, they typically dip. So, our individual organism examples, we need to talk about both the black-throated loon and the ringed seal as it relates or as they relate to the specific properties of water and talk about the adaptations that they have experienced in order to help adapt them to their environment and to life within and on water. So the black-throated loon have webbed feet and efficient streamlined body shape which aids the loon in movement and that has to do with viscosity. They are very aerodynamic and therefore able to pass through the viscosity of the air and water as they go about expending as little energy as possible to help keep themselves alive. The bird requires energy to overcome the viscosity of water, to move across the water surface, and even more when it dives for food. This specific bird can dive underwater in search of fish and other food items, and they have to be somewhat streamlined and aerodynamic, which allows them to expend less energy moving through the viscosity of the medium that they're moving through. When the air is very cold, the surrounding water is likely to be warmer than the air because the high specific heat of water allows its temperature to remain relatively stable in comparison to land. I know that it seems really counterintuitive to be in or on water when the temperature is near freezing, but if the temperature of the air is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, it is likely that the water is higher than 32 degrees, otherwise the water would be frozen. So the air might be 30 degrees Fahrenheit, but the water might actually be 38 degrees Fahrenheit, which means the water is warmer for the bird than it would be just in the air. Spends much of its time in water on the surface, relying on the buoyant force of the water to float. Because water has a high buoyancy, it causes or allows the loon to float on the surface without expending much energy. When the bird is in the water, the high thermal conductivity of the water would cause the loon to lose more body heat when it is in air. And these birds have an oil gland near their tail that they use their beaks to rub on and therefore move the oil or transfer the oil all over their feathers to make them incredibly waterproof. And so when you look at these organisms in the water, there is a lot of water beading, which again, if we talk about the properties of water is cohesion and adhesion. These water molecules sticking together, forming these beads or droplets would be cohesion. Because water has cohesive forces, it allows those water molecules to bead together. It also doesn't actually make the bird wet because the water doesn't penetrate the feathers, meaning there is an air gap between the environment and the skin of these particular birds. The ringed seal in a lot of cases is very similar to the loon. The seal is buoyant, although it cannot float on the surface like the loon, it can keep its nose out of the water relatively easily and allows the seal to rest while it is breathing, meaning it doesn't have to spend a lot of energy to help keep itself at the surface. These seals spend a lot of time underwater to catch food and evade predation. They have a streamlined shape and paddle-like feet that are great assets in overcoming the viscosity of water. Again, because it is harder to move in water than it is on land, these organisms have acquired the adaptations like large paddle feet or webbed feet that allows them to move through the viscous medium and allows them to move through the water very easily. Ring seals are protected from very low air temperatures by the relatively high temperatures of Arctic water, which is due to the specific heat capacity of water. Again, like I said in the last slide, even though the air temperatures are incredibly low, water temperatures are always higher than the air temperature simply because water has a high specific heat capacity, meaning it can absorb a lot of energy without actually dropping or changing temperatures. We know that while the air temps can be below freezing, the water is likely not at freezing or below freezing because simply it is still in the liquid form. And we know that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Seawater actually 
freezes at a lower point or a lower temperature than fresh water. So the Arctic Sea, where these organisms live, again, the water is likely at a higher temperature than the air. Since water has high thermal heat conductivity, they need to minimize body heat loss. They have a thick blubber layer under their skin to insulate them from the cold temps. Again, that's really important in maintaining homeostasis and a constant internal temperature. That's it for this particular video. If you learned something, give it a thumbs up. Leave your questions in the comments. Subscribe to the channel. We will see you later.